We share the planet with them, but what responsibility do we have to the many animal species out there? This week, conversations with animal rights crusaders who say we all need to take action before it's too late. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. Most of us have heard the horror stories about the treatment and processing of animals that eventually make it onto our dinner tables. But as the saying goes, seeing is believing. A word of warning, the video we're about to show you is disturbing and may not be suitable for all viewers. From farm to fridge. Pigs raised for meat typically live only five to six months, a mere fraction of their natural lifespan in overcrowded pens like this. Workers frequently tattoo the animals with ID numbers by hitting them with metal spiked mallets. Crowded by the thousands into filthy sheds, chickens and turkeys are denied many of their most basic natural behaviors and needs, such as fresh air and exercise. Through genetic selection, chickens and turkeys raised for meat have been bred to grow so large so quickly that many suffer crippling leg disorders, chronic joint pain, and even fatal heart attacks. The majority of today's dairy cows are confined on factory farms. Some spend almost their entire lives standing on concrete floors. Others are crammed into massive mud lots. Today, approximately one in five fish consumed worldwide is raised in captivity. Like factory farmed animals on land, farm raised fish are crowded by the tens of thousands in small disease and excrement ridden areas for their entire lives. When fish reach market weight, they are loaded onto tanker trucks and shipped to slaughter, where common killing methods include slow suffocation. Our next guest is the narrator of that clip from the documentary Farm to Fridge. That rich and powerful voice is just one of actor and activist James Cromwell's many talents. In 1995, he rose to international fame after starring as Farmer Hoggett in the hit film Babe, for which he received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Since then, he's continued to build a long and successful career on stage, television, and in feature films. James Cromwell is a longtime animal rights activist and ethical vegan. Animal rights remains a cause that's very close to his heart, and he's been talking about the issue now for decades. He's here now to tell us how it all started with a pig that transformed his life. And welcome to Full Frame, James. Let me ask you about Babe. I I've uh, seen you talk about this, and, and, and originally you weren't even sure you wanted to take this role, and yet it's a role that changed your life in many ways. Talk to us about that. Well, when I got the script from my agent, uh, you know, <laughs> If you're not very diligent, you flip through it to see how many scenes you're in and how many lines you have. And I think there were about 16 or 17 lines. I thought, this is absurd. And I knew nothing about CGI, which is a computer generated image, the way they make the mouths move. I just thought they would put peanut butter in the animal's mouth, which is the way they used to do it. And it was a kid's movie. And um, I liked the story. Uh, and a friend of mine said, look, Listen, it's a free trip to Australia. If the, if the film tanks, it's the pig's fault, not yours. So uh, I, um, I took the free trip, and uh, it's been quite a ride. Yeah. The trip continues in many respects. It's been it quite a journey, indeed. right? It, it never get off it. Why, uh, why do you think it was so enormously successful? First of all, it was a great story, beautifully done. Um, the uh, animals were extraordinary. The, the man who trained them was brilliant in how he did it. Uh, it. People don't, they just take it for granted, but every one of those shots is a trick shot because animals don't behave like that. The idea behind the film was that the animals would relate to each other the way human beings relate to each other. When we talk to each other, even if we're walking, we look at each other. Animals don't do that. They always look straight ahead. People could not only enjoy uh, the storytelling, but they also sensed that there was a larger message. And here was a man 
who intuited that there was a consciousness in this other sentient being that needed to be expressed as much as his consciousness needed to be expressed. And people understand that because we have very little opportunity, most people in this culture, to really express ourselves. And uh, so I, when I went the first time to see it, uh, it opened in a very little theater, no fanfare, and uh, obviously the kids were loving it. And I, I heard some adults start to laugh. And I knew then that the story had hooked them too. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it was such a success. Let me ask you about uh, your pathway. Uh, I, I know you were a vegetarian and then you shifted to being an ethical vegan, and I think some mm -hmm. people might be confused by uh, the difference between the two. Can you describe for us what the difference is? Well, it's a process. Uh, I first became a vegetarian because I came across the country on my motorcycle and went through the stockyards in Texas uh, where all those animals are pinned uh, standing in their own excrement uh, and wait, awaiting death. And it seemed to go on for the entire day, as far as you could see on the other side of the road. And I said to myself, I, I, I can't be part of this. And I began the process of eliminating um, animal products from my diet. And of course, you run into all the things uh, in your mind I can't do without this, I can't, I have to have this, what happens to my protein, nothing's available, I'm tired of eating salad, all the excuses that you give yourself. And slowly, slowly you work through this process. I made myself sick at one point, mainly because of my judgment about people who were still eating animal products. I had to let that go. Um, so I had basically come to terms with you know, eating eggs every once in a while and fish, not knowing that those two things were probably the worst. Uh, and then went to Australia to do this film with these extraordinary animals. And every day at midday, whenever lunch was, I'd go and on the table uh, would be every animal that I had just worked with being served for lunch. The Australians really don't like eating anything that they don't kill. So, uh, uh, I, I thought, you know, I've come this far. I might as well, as I like to say, go the whole hog. Um, just, uh, you know, carry it on. And then what's the reason? Am I doing this because it makes me feel better? Because but fr frankly, I, I don't know the difference. I've forgotten what I felt like when I ate. I don't get sick as much as I did when I ate meat. But I realized that if we are to have a planet, if we're to live on this planet, and if we're to live on this planet peacefully and take responsibility for it the way, the way the Pope has exhorted us to today in his encyclical, uh, we have to have, we have to, we have to, we have to stop animal agriculture. We, we simply cannot slaughter billions of animals every year uh, with the um, cruelty and the suffering and the waste involved in that and its effect on the planet and on our psyches and continue to live on this planet. You know, uh, we, we showed a clip from uh, Farm to Fridge, and I have to be really honest with you. I, I sat down and I was watching that documentary, and I struggled to get through it. Um, yeah. is, was that, the, was that what, what the goal was? And, and how have you seen it change the dynamic out there? I mean, how has it changed the consciousness? Uh, the documentary changes the consciousness because it, when you have a visual image of it, you can no longer say to yourself, I don't know and I don't care to know. So whenever anybody is confronted by any suffering, it's, you know, it's that we don't see the re results of the wars that we are fighting because for a long time we could never see the coffins arriving back in the United States. When you cannot see what it looks like in a uh, hatchery, or you cannot see what it looks in a, like in a slaughterhouse, or you cannot see what it looks like in, um, uh, in feedlots, then you can say to yourself, oh, it can't be that bad. Uh, anyway, you know, that's what they're, that's what they're for. They're, to, I, they're to feed us. Look, look, people have to live. We've been eating meat for millions of years, they say, of course, which is not true, actually, if they would put any thought. So what the images do is they provoke a process where somebody has to compare their own um, 
th their own indulgence, their own uh, habit with a reality which, when presented with, they would not accept. Uh, and, uh, and it's on the basis of that confrontation that people shift. Let me ask you about horse racing because there's been there's such a buildup with the Triple Crown and the pageantry of horse racing and, and the, the storied history and all of that. And yet you know the other side of horse racing, which I think people are also unaware of. Well, I actually didn't know the other side. I took a, a part in a film called Secretariat, and people called me from PETA and said, are, are you crazy? Do you know what horse racing is? I, I had no idea. I thought, you know, it's, it's horse racing. It's just fine. Then I, when I actually went down to Kentucky and I began to talk to some of the jockeys and some of the people who work with horses, and you understand it's sort of like um, uh, the NBA. We see the creme de la creme, but there are a lot of races before the creme de la creme. And there are a lot of races at the county level and, and um, 4-H in rodeos or whatever. And these horses, of course, are not trained with the consciousness and diligence and compassion of the star athletes. And People buy racehorses at auction because they think it might be fun without having any idea of what's entailed. Their um, circumstances may change. They can no longer afford it. They abandon the horse. Or they send the horse to a slaughterhouse so that it's slaughtered and sold uh, as, uh, as meat in uh, Asia or wherever. Uh, I don't know. In Canada, too, I understand. So, uh, and these horses break down at a incredible rate both in training and the races themselves and have to be put down and the jockeys who ride them are killed um, um, very frequently and maimed and um, uh, uh, injured and they have no health care and they have no pension plan and they're working for very very little money and they're tra working you know they ride four or five races and they get in their car and they drive all day and they get to another place and they do it again we have to come to grips that some of these things that we take for granted, that we think are part of our culture and that uh, are benign, are not benign. Somebody pays for all this. There's a cost, and the creature that, we, that bears the brunt of that cost doesn't get a vote. So it's up to us, who can speak, to speak for them and see that it doesn't continue. Well, James, we've run out of time, but thanks so much for talking to us. Certainly appreciate it. My pleasure. Up next, from Europe to South America, one animal rights organization is saving lives and changing national policies through any means possible.